You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network. So far, the past two days have not been bad, but my whole entire week last week was just dreadful. And, you know, it, it just ended with um, me being dragged to a club, nightclub, with my sister to see some rapper that I don't listen to and don't know anything about. And then... Um, culminated with two people spilling alcohol on me twice and me being in the bathroom for like two hours just, just over the situation. And then while I'm in the bathroom, I'm getting hit on by three lesbians. It's just like, wow, like, come on. <laughs> That's a hell of a night. Why does that not ever happen to me? <laughs> and then, then, I'm minding my own business, and the freaking security guard sees me standing in the bathroom, and he's like, why are you standing in the bathroom? And I'm like, um, is there a sign here that says I can't stand here? Like, it's a free goddamn country. And then he takes me to the VIP section, and I sat in the VIP section the entire night. <laughs> That's the only part. So, you so up- let me get this right. You get... Liquor spilled all over you. You get hit on by three lesbians. By the way, were they hot lesbians or just kind of whatever? Well, one was kind of like, you know, the lesbian that I think she looked like, or is she a man? And then the other two were hot. Okay. Yeah. See, why does this not ever happen to me? Why don't I ever get hit on by hot lesbians? And then, and then you give the security guide lip, so he takes you to the VIP room. <laughs> yes. And that was a bad <laughs> weekend? <laughs> Afterwards, Jesus. it was good, but Jesus, before, I, I, it was regard. It was just horrible. Let, let me trade your bad weekend for one of my good ones. <laughs> <laughs> See, Kev's feeling me here. By the way, that is Killa Kev, the uh, backbone of AngryMarks.com. Hello, Kev. Hello. By the Listen. way, happy Memorial Day, Mr. Frank Vaughn, and thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't have a job, and my kids wouldn't have food on the table. So it's it's a pleasure to serve. Um, I tell you what, you know. And by the way, I want to tell the marks out there, and I want to say hello to everybody in the Angry Marks chat room. I'm on my iPad, so I'm not going to be able to monitor the chat room tonight. CR, I hope you can do that for me. Um, if they all type slow. <laughs> yeah. Right. So listen, guys. Marks chat room. Slow down. We got to keep. We got to keep this thing rolling. Um, by the way, I, I want to tell everybody that, that, you know, we don't just phone in this show when we do it on Tuesday nights. Ciara and I, believe it or not, over the last few weeks have started doing a lot of show prep in the nights leading up to Tuesday. Have we not? Yep. Yeah, we, we've gotten to where we chat quite a bit and we kind of go over what it is we want to talk about and sort of what our thoughts were from the past week. And um, we came up with what we thought was a pretty solid plan for this week. And I'm about to throw it all out the window. Well, not all of it, but I'm about to throw a major portion of it out the window. The thinking was that watching Raw and SmackDown the last few weeks, not a damn thing has happened worth really talking about on either show. So we basically started coming up with our own topics prior to even seeing what Raw had to offer. And this past Sunday night, we were chatting online, and we came up with what we thought was a great plan for this show, thinking we're going to watch Raw tomorrow night, nothing of any consequence is going to happen. And then, you know, so we're not going to let that really dictate what we talk about on Tuesday. Um the only problem is that something of consequence did not happen last night. And, CR, I want to open the show with this. And, you know, people can bitch about John Cena all they want, but the fact is, is what did not happen that was of consequence last night is we did not see John Cena on camera at all. Because, you know, WWE really wants to cram him down your throats right now. So, um the, the reason I think that was a significant thing is because, first of all, I was reading through Twitter earlier, and I do follow John Cena, and come to find out, they it, it wasn't that he was unavailable last night. It's not that he was off taking care of business or resting at home or whatever have you. The man was actually in the building last night. Yeah. They didn't put him on camera. Nothing. Nothing at all. And I, I want to ask you, do you buy or sell that move, and why? Um... Hmm, that one's tough. Because, one, I will buy it because it builds up what happened towards the end of Raw, making it seem more like, oh, we need John Cena to rescue us the next week. And it makes people more 
anticipate him returning. Two, I would sell it because when I'm expecting him to show up, he doesn't show up. <laughs> Instead, we get 15 minutes of Big Show beating up the the WWE Tag Team Champions and Brodus Clay. Um, yes, and I initially thought about Big Show jumping Brodus Clay last night and beating him down, and, and, and I, I didn't like it at first, but I've, I've had today to kind of think through it in my head, and I'm actually going to buy the whole thing, and I'll tell you why. And Kev, I'd like to get your thoughts on this also, but I, I'm, I'm going to buy the whole thing, and the reason why is because people have for years, and, and we've talked about this back and forth online, Kev, you and I have, people for years have had a hard time buying anything the big show has stood for you know here's this seven foot tall 445 pound giant or however much he weighs who has been cast as cartoon characters as goofy lovable whatevers as at times a badass but then that always goes away very quickly and a guy of that size of that stature and with the capability to pull off nearly any damn character they give him why not just go all the way down that dark path with him to see where it leads? And the reason I think it was important to both keep Cena off camera last night and make sure Big Show was on it as much as possible was to really drive home the fact that he ain't fucking around this time. Yeah. Yeah, he beat down the tag team champions, but come on. Everybody knows that Vince wipes his ass with the tag team titles anyway, okay? Yes, he, he beat down Brodus Clay. But let's face it, Brodus Clay gets a lot, a lot of camera time. He's got his whole shtick where he comes out and dances, but he's a mid-carter. Just because he has a dance routine and a couple of cheerleaders doesn't mean he's not a mid-carter. In fact, I'll point you back to a couple of other mid-carters that also had a dance routine back in the day, Rikishi being one of them and The Godfather being another. Who? The, exactly. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't who, don't who The Godfather. Just because you can come out there and dance around and get the crowd going does not mean you're destined for big and, and, and great things in WWE. Ask Rikishi and the Godfather about that, okay? Um, so, Ash Flash Funk. Okay, exactly. So <laughs> just because Brodus Clay gets a lot of camera time does not mean he's a big-time player, folks. And he, he is a mid-carder. He's not a jobber, so to speak, because the guy's still undefeated in WWE. He hasn't lost him. Well, let me rephrase that. He's undefeated as this current character. You know, I mean, he was in as part of the the Nexus for a while, and he certainly suffered his losses there. But the guy's undefeated as the Funkasaurus, okay? So he, he's he's not a jobber, so to speak, but he's not a he's not a player, all right? I mean, he looks he comes out looking like a player, but he's not a player on the WWE scene right now. He's not involved in anything important. But I will say this: I thought he got some important character development last night when the Big Show was walking around just stalking any and every person he could possibly choose from to be his opponent. And I love what Brodus Clay did. He stepped right up into Big Show's face and said, "If you're looking for an opponent, make it me, so I can give you another reason to cry." I heard you loved, got beef. <laughs> lo- yeah, heard you got beef. Loved. I love the intensity from Brodus Clay last night. That suddenly turned my mind away from him just being a goofy, lovable dancer guy that squashes people into suddenly this guy's got some some like character depth that we can maybe explore down the road. I like the idea of a big show Brodus Clay feud down the road. You know what? I mean, we've all I've always seen this out of Brodus Clay though. Uh, do you remember? I don't remember, know if you remember. You remember the first night that he debuted with the Funkasaurus character, though? Yeah, and one of our friends on ISCA said that Vince hates black people when he did that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to get into that, but uh, afterwards, after the show, uh, on WWE.com, they had video of him doing a, a, a photo shoot, taking pictures and stuff, and, and Josh Matthews comes up and, and basically asks him, uh, you know, are the fans and the wrestlers supposed to take you seriously with this character? And he basically halts the whole damn thing and completely mugs on Josh Matthews and tells him, you know, look, I'm having fun with this, but don't doubt me. I will still stomp your ass. Yeah, don't get the guy twisted. I mean, I, I love the intensity that we saw last night. And he's not as big as Big Show, obviously, but he is of comparable size. I mean, he's a big motherfucker. Yeah, you know what I'm finding interesting 
Last week you had the Miz calling him out. This week you've got Big Show calling him out. This Funkasaurus character has to be something for him. If you've got bigger guys like that calling him out, and he's not even done anything yet. He's not even wrestled for a mid-card title. And you've got former world champions calling him out. That's my issue with it. You know, like I was saying to Frank last night, Big Show versus Brodus Clay, it could have the potential of being a good feud down the line, but right now... We have this guy that's, you know, the Funkasaurus character is still kind of fresh. It's kind of new. He hasn't really wrestled for a mid-card title. He's, you know, just really now just started having matches where people are actually starting to take him seriously. Like the past couple matches he's had with The Miz. And it's just like, okay, we can't put him up against any other mid-card guys. we got to put him up against former world champions. And, you know, what is really the benefit of having this mid-carder go over former world champions if he's not going after a title or investing in a feud? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, what we've got going on right now is, is yes, he's a mid-carder, and, yeah, yeah, he's kind of going over world champions. But look at the three world champions that he's routinely gone over lately, The Miz, Jack Swagger, and Dolph Ziggler, okay? All three of these guys, for whatever reason, are in Vince's shithouse right now. I don't know what they did or why, and it might just be him testing their character to see if they can handle being de-pushed. I don't know. Um, In Swagger's case, I really don't think he'll be employed a year from now. And I have a pretty good track record for predicting this, if anybody remembers my Chris Masters prediction from five years ago. So, Jack Swagger is of no consequence to anything going on right now. In fact, after what we saw on Raw last night, he's about to not even be affiliated with Dolph Ziggler anymore. All right. Uh, And I've always said that of those two, Dolph Ziggler is the one that's going to end up getting over. Okay. But those three guys right now, yes, they're all technically three world, former world champions, even though Dolph Ziggler's credentials are very, very shaky at best. They're all three technically former world champions, and, and Brodus Clay has gone over all three of them to some degree or another. In fact, I think he's even gone over both Ziggler and Swagger together at one point. Right. But he's not going over world former world champions that like matter right now, like a Randy Orton or a you know a, an Alberto Del Rio or a Daniel Bryan or a John Cena. But he hasn't he- gone over anybody that really matters to the storylines right now. I'm just like, you know what, like I said last night in the chat room and I was saying to you, Frank, Dundee creative confuses me. (laughs) Yeah, no shit. I'm just so confused, you know, I like Dolph Ziggler as a singles competitor and, you know, from what's been going on that he's got heat with Vince and, you know, he's in the doghouse or whatever. Who knows what's going on? They throw him in his tag team with Jack Swagger, who had nothing else to do because they weren't doing shit with him but making him lose to everybody. And they throw him in his tag team, and I'm like, hmm, this has potential of actually being something for both them to benefit from. And it really has not. It's not doing anything for Swagger, and it's really not doing anything for Ziggler. It's more so pulling Ziggler down. And we seen last night the shades of the team splitting and Dolph Ziggler saying, that should be me. I shouldn't be in this tag team. And I'm kind of like, okay, why didn't this happen months ago? Where Ziggler had the epiphany of, why am I tagging with this guy with the side part? This it just doesn't make sense to me. I, the side part? <laughs> yes, the side part. The lovely, you know, comb over. Just, yep. oh God, looks like he he's looks about five like, years old. <laughs> he looks even more like Biff Tannen now than he ever did before. But, uh, yeah, and, and you know... I, th- I do think Jack Swagger's going to end up getting Marty Jannetty at some point here, okay? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he's clearly the weak link in that whole thing. And I loved what Ziggler said last night coming out of their match after they, by the way, lost again. He said, you know what, I'm better than this. And then he stomped off, I am better than this. And I have to agree. I think he's better than being saddled with Jack Swagger. And I'm not even working this angle. I'm telling you straight up from a wrestling fan's perspective. He he and his character and his abilities in the ring are better than to be saddled with Jack Swagger, who is going nowhere. It's better than being saddled with Vicky Guerrero, who's not even the best manager in WWE anymore, and she was the only one three weeks ago, okay? 
it, it's 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 enough. And and I think we've cooled Ziggler enough. And, and I see what Vince was doing there. He's taking three guys, including the Miz, and he's cooling them down to see which one rises back to the top. And clearly, it's going to be Ziggler. I don't yeah. see. I don't see. I don't even see the Miz really getting any heat. I mean, he just. You know, he went out there last night and jobbed again. And by the way, that blew my mind. He, he, he faced Christian last night in a match. And the Miz basically beat Christian's ass the entire match. I mean, <laughs> dominated him the entire fucking match. And then out of yes. nowhere, Christian ends up hitting the kill switch, and it's over. That was like one of three moves Christian got in that whole fucking match. So the Miz goes out there, busts his ass, works his ass off, and eats a loss out of nowhere right at the very end. And again, you're left scratching your head and going, why? What did he do to piss off Vince? I mean, did he throw a shot into Stephanie, or what the hell's going on here? I don't know. The thing is with The Miz is, um, you know, like I was saying to you, it's, you know, okay, he's been on a losing streak, fine. But like you said, he dominated the whole match, and then Christian just pops up with the freaking... You know, it kind of remind. I seriously thought I was watching the Divas match where Beth Phoenix is beating the hell out of Kelly Kelly, and Kelly Kelly just jumps up with the K two, <laughs> one two three, yeah. and then Orton just comes out there and RKO's him, and I'm like, wow, like, you know, I don't really want to say that maybe he's in the doghouse. I mean, I know he's filming that Marine Night uh, one hundred gazillion sequel that there is but it's kind of like damn a year ago this guy was on top and now he's forgotten well, like did anybody realize you know a week or so ago when he was feuding with Brodus Clay back and forth did anybody remember that The Miz was a former world champion no <laughs> that's what I'm saying like in a year's time they made you forget that he's a former world champion, that he was on WrestleMania, and, you know, they made you forget all that so quickly. Yeah, and, and like you pointed out just now, it wasn't even that he jobbed to Christian last night. It was afterwards, Randy Orton comes out there and just lays him out for no fucking reason at all. I mean, okay, Miz was on the mic bitching about how, you know, I want this match stricken from the record, and I'm the guy that scored the win that gave John Laurinaitis GM ship of both shows, and yada, yada, yada. Well, that's fine, but that's Miz's only win this whole fucking calendar year, if I'm not mistaken. You know? And that's the, that's the one win that all of us fans wish he hadn't gotten. So, I, I, don't, I don't really know what the fuck is going on with Miz anymore, but... Randy Orton coming out there and laying him out was just the the, the culmination of his you know of, of how far he's fallen to me. And was it really? You know what? There's so much crap from Raw last night. It was just, you know, some people found Raw to be amazing, like Alex Golf last night in Raw reaction, and I said he was on drugs. Um, I found Raw to be very lackluster, so lackluster that it was freaking ashy. And it needed every kind of lotion that there is, even from Bath and Body Works, cocoa butter, just the, the works. And vanilla sugar. Yes, it needs the warm vanilla sugar. I mean everything, vanilla beam, everything. It just needs the works. Well, and, and, and Raw and SmackDown both have the same problem right now. And you know what that is? And I'm very calmly and very quietly just going to tell you that I have no idea what the fuck is even going on in this company anymore. I mean, let's think about this for a minute. You and I talked about this before, okay? Who is Daniel Bryan feuding with? I don't know. CM Punk, supposedly, right? He's the number one contender for the WWE Championship. He even affirmed that last night with a victory over CM Punk, which we're going to get to in a second. But Daniel Bryan is feuding with CM Punk, so why the fuck is he on SmackDown beating the shit out of Kane with a chair and then costing him the number one contendership for the World Heavyweight title? Kane had that match. It was a triple threat match on SmackDown. It was Kane, Alberto Del Rio, and Randy Orton in a triple threat match, which I was just pleased that Kane was even put into the title picture. Okay, I thought, you know what? It's about time somebody recognized that this guy is still a player. He goes out there, he's about to win the fucking match. He choke slams Del Rio, 
and he's about to pin him, and here comes fucking Daniel Bryan running down the ramp with that chair again. Why? What the, What does Daniel Bryan and Kane have to do with each other? I get that they had heat a few weeks ago, but I don't understand now why if Daniel Bryan is feuding with CM Punk on another show for another title, why the fuck he's getting involved in Kane's life over here on this show for that title? The because only thing I can think of is... Kane got May 19th and May 28th mixed up. It must have been. I mean, I <laughs> guess so. It. So then, okay, so answer me this then. Who is Big Show feuding with right now? Himself. Because I'm just, you know, like I told you, there is just so, I, I don't know what their creative team does in the creative room. But they all need to be shot between the eyes. Everything that is going on right now, it's just like, I feel so bad for the little kids that watch this stuff. Because I'm an adult, and it confuses me. I know they're confused. Yeah, so, okay, Daniel Bryan's feuding with CM Punk, but yet he's also feuding with Kane, I guess. And by the and way, so AJ. CM Punk. And by the way, so is CM Punk, because CM Punk beat Kane's ass with a chair last night. I, I don't... The, the, the whole thing's just a clusterfuck to me. Then then over here, we've got Big Show supposedly feuding with John Cena, but now he's also feuding with Brodus Clay and apparently the tag team champions. Okay? Um, I, I don't know what the hell is going on anymore. Everybody who's supposed to be feuding with a person has apparently got multiple feuds going on right now. I don't, it's it's so confusing that I can't even understand the rhyme or reason to it. And it's crossing shows now. You know, people can say what they want about the old brand extension where you had Raw over here and you had SmackDown over here. And for a while, they each had their own separate pay-per-views. Then they decided that wasn't cost effective. So they blended them into one pay-per-view because nobody wants to see fucking two pay-per-views a month, right? Yeah. So we, we started to to sort of streamline that a little bit. But it was still sort of separated. You know, you had your Raw storylines and your SmackDown storylines. The only time those two really crossed was at Survivor Series, right? Yeah. Well, now we've got feuds going on all over the fucking place involving people that have nothing to do with each other. And I don't know what the hell to do anymore. And by the way, you brought up the AJ thing, and that's a good call because apparently AJ's in CM Punk's corner now, and he digs crazy chicks. Uh, Well, that's all well and good, dude, but... I mean, you saw what that did to, you know, Daniel Bryan was a world champion until he got mixed up with that chick, and now he's not. So you going to risk losing your title to Daniel Bryan over this chick? Yeah, I don't know about that. The, the thing is with AJ is, you know, I've been saying this for a long time. This storyline between her and Daniel Bryan is just, it's ridiculous, and I just don't like it because... Look at where AJ is now. Her career is really a standstill. She's now too busy being the psycho girlfriend backstage, and now she's hitting on CM Punk. And it it, it just mind boggles me that, you you know, I'm fine with Divas being storylines, but why are we putting her back in the storyline with Danny Bryan when I'm thinking – that you're going to move her on and actually have her, you know, be a diva. And now she's going after CM Punk, and then CM Punk's supposed to be feuding with Daniel Bryan, but then it doesn't really seem like he's feuding with Daniel Bryan, because last night after Kane attacked Daniel Bryan, and the crowd was cheering like, yay, Kane, then he attacks Kane, and then I'm like, wait, why are you attacking Kane? And then AJ is just standing there at ringside, and she calls him. I'm confused. And then CM what? Punk jumps Kane, and... and, and- I mean, I hate to say it because he's a heel right now, but and, and he's, by the way, he's seven feet tall, but poor Kane. I mean, everybody's just fucking this guy up with chairs, and there's really no reason for it. And then the thing is with Kane, like I said last night in Ingram, my chat room, Kane returned a couple months ago. Supposed to be this big, scary monster. We're supposed to be Great scared behavior. of him. Yes, he tried to kill Zack Ryder, and speaking of him, where the fuck is he? And then we had this big, you know, scary Kane, him and Randy Orton are feuding, and that feud died quietly. And then out of nowhere, Kane gets easily beat up by chairs. 
Kane, a couple months ago, no one could beat you up. What happened? I'm just oh, no. so confused. How did he become so vulnerable already? I don't know. And, and, and by the way, while we're talking about that, let's look at Big Show for a minute. Now, I dig the psychotic, can't be stopped, dominant, doesn't give a shit about anybody but himself, Big Show. I dig that. That is kind of a fresh twist on a character, on a guy that I've been watching since he was the giant in WCW years and years and years ago. Okay? So this is kind of a fresh new twist on this. And, and, and it, you could argue that they should have booked him like this a decade and a half ago, okay? Because of how big he is yeah. and how mean he can be and, and, and all, you know, how scary he can be and all that. Um, but at this point in his career, it's a good move. You know, I mean, the guy's not a wrestler. He's a brawler. I mean, he's, he's fucking seven feet tall and 450 pounds or whatever. The guy's not going to be putting, you know, hip tossing people and coming off the top rope with, you know, elbows. And I mean, he's not going to be doing crazy shit like that at his age and at his size. OK, so the guy's a big, beefy brawler. Get that. Um, so this is pre- a, a pretty good move for him at this point in his career. The problem I have, though, is is if we're going to paint him as this unstoppable, dominant character who just cares about himself, then why is he going after, in order, John Cena, who is not a champion, Brodus Clay, who's nothing right now, and tag team champions that have nothing to do with singles wrestling at the moment? Why is he going after those guys instead of asserting himself at the top of the food chain and going after a world title? He was just world champion, what, back in January, right? for, okay, like 38 seconds, but still. He, he was just the world champion back in February, or back in January. So why why is that not his goal right now? Why is it his goal to just stalk the locker room and beat the shit out of the likes of Alex Riley, who he threw into a wall last night? Why is that his game right now instead of going after something that means something? Well, see, my main issue is with this big show is that... <sighs> It kind of pisses me off because they made him face, they made him this big, lovable giant. Everybody loves the big show, you know. And then they just, they do this embarrassing thing where he's on his knees begging for his job and stuff like that. And then he gets his job back and blah, blah, blah. He beats up Cena. And and it's just like, okay, I'm fine with you turning to my heel every once in a while, but how many fucking times have we seen this with the Big Show? And then in a couple months, he'll be the happy, good, lucky, jolly Big Show. And then, you know, the thing with him and John Cena, we've seen this feud so many times. You know, I would be fine if they had just a one-off match and Big Show was like, or you know what, fuck the one-off match. Had Big Show be like, you know what, Johnny, since you rehired me, I want the fucking title. I want Punk. Instead, no one cares about the world title. And I'm just like, why is no one going after this title anymore? Is it that, you know, that non-important? Like, what's going on? Yeah, and, and, you know, my thing is, is I'm going to add to what you just said. You know, you said, how many times have we seen this with Big Show where they turning heel and then three months later he's a face again? I get that. How many times have we seen over the last five years that somebody turns heel and immediately starts wearing thousand dollar suits and condescending to the crowd? And that's, another, like, that's like the only move they know how to take with 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 a heel anymore. We've seen Chris Jericho do it. We've seen the Miz do it. You know, we Alberto Del Rio. That's his whole fucking gimmick. Um, uh, Big Show's got a suit on now. What is it with the fucking suits? Why can't somebody come out in, like, jeans and a ripped T-shirt and go, I'm going to kick your fucking ass? I think it's I mean, mainly the only person who do that is Brock Lesnar. Oh, God, What's he wears that? the same thing every week. I think the whole suit thing is... It's the made <sighs> it's... man persona. It's what? It's the made man persona. Now well, it's fine, also that... And then... is overdone. Yeah, but it actually more so to me when we first really start seeing it a lot is when Evolution was around, which is basically the E's version of the Four Horsemen. So I think everybody is just trying to do that whole thing of the made man and yada, yada, yada. But my main issue is it's not the suits. It's 
why every year or so? Actually, it's been like every fucking year now. Why every year do we have to have some type of authority figure, whether it's a laptop or some douche, fire a baby face and then rehire him and he becomes a heel? How many times are we going to do this? I'm tired of this same thing. Like, come on. We we are officially out of ideas, I think, is what the problem is. We are officially <laughs> out of ideas. I mean Well let me uh, write your fucking <laughs> ideas. I mean Jesus. <laughs> the only person I've seen that, that has really managed to rehab his own character without the help of turning heel or face is Cena. And Kev, you pointed this out online earlier, and that is that, that John Cena somehow went into Chicago. And besides Toronto, that might be the one city on this planet that hates John Cena the most. I mean, Chicago has traditionally shit all over John Cena, regardless of, of who he's facing or what. He marched into Chicago for Extreme Rules and got the typical shit storm from the crowd at the start of the match. And by the end, they were fucking chanting for him. The whole crowd was chanting for him to beat Brock Lesnar. And then when he did, they fucking exploded. And he got a standing ovation. He got a standing ovation in Chicago. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I don't understand what happened. I mean, and everybody and and everybody either hated him or wanted him to turn heel. And what happened in that match? I don't Brock understand. Lesnar happened in that match. And I'm going to tell you something. That right there is worth whatever money they paid Lesnar to come back right there. They literally... They literally saved Vince McMahon from having to take drastic steps with John Cena's character. Okay? I, mean, I, I don't that, understand. That right there, he made that money back on t-shirt sales the next day. Yeah, I, I don't understand. How the hell did Brock Lester make John Cena cool again? I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something. It's lasted ever since. I, I, I'm with you, Kev. I don't remember the last time he's been roundly booed by any crowd that he's been in front of. Hell, he wasn't even there. He, well, he was there last night, but he didn't even show up in New Orleans last night. And the crowd was fucking chanting for him. The entire crowd was chanting for him for half the fucking show. Yeah. Isn't when that they crazy? Busy chanting, when they weren't busy chanting for Jericho, which we're going to get to in just a minute. But Who? Right. So I'm blown away that John Cena has just been John Cena, and he literally has just risen above the shit. You know, that's not just a slogan on a T-shirt. That's the guy's fucking life. And they didn't have to do a drastic turn, character turn for him. And now the guy shows up in front of live crowds, they cheer him. You know, and, and I mean, and I think, you know what I think some of it is, honest to God? He jobbed to the rock at WrestleMania. That made a lot of the fanboys go, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe he's not being crammed down our throats. And then, yeah, he beat Brock Lesnar, but he had to go the hard road to get it done. I mean, he got his ass whipped in that match. Okay? But then he turned around and jobbed to John Laurinaitis at the next pay-per-view. <sighs> John Cena, I think he's beginning to win his respect back because people are beginning to realize that this guy is not afraid to go out there and make an absolute ass out of himself. It's one of the, it's, it's the same reason that Vince McMahon, whether he's a heel or not, immediately spikes ratings every time he shows up because that guy is willing to put himself through fucking anything for the good of that company. I mean, he let Donald Trump shave him fucking bald yeah. for the good of his company. He let Stone Cold Steve Austin drown him in beer. You know, he let the he let DX drown him in, in supposedly outhouse shit. Him and his son Shane. I mean, yeah. that guy will go through fucking anything to put his company over, even at his own expense, especially at his expense. And Cena has been doing a lot of the same shit this year. People can complain about how he's been in four main events in a row without a title involved. But I'm going to tell you something. He's been out there to he, allow himself to get humiliated for the good of the company. And crowds have come back around to him. And I'm sure there's people in the chat room right now going ape shit, but I don't really care. The truth is the truth. People are not shitting on Cena anymore like they were six months ago. And that's a fact. So I'm with you. We don't always have to do the cheap heel slash face turn to get somebody over with a crowd. There are other ways to get it done. Sometimes it comes down to the simple, who are we matching this guy up with? You know? You want to get Brodus Clay over and you really want to make him somebody in that company? He eventually needs to go through the big show to get that done. That's got to happen. And yeah, we saw last night that that, is, that feud can be fucking money if they just make it happen. 
That's why I think they need to blow this this feud with John Cena off rather quickly. They need to send John Cena home on vacation for four or five months to rest up, get through his divorce, and get his shit together, okay? And let Big Show move on to to putting Brodus Clay over. Big Show's at a place in his career now, ironclad contract and fat bonus or not, he's at a place in his career now where he doesn't need a title. Not only does he not need a title, but he doesn't need to win. And Kane is in the same place in his life. I really wish that, that what they're doing with Kane made more sense from a booking standpoint. But the yeah. fact that he doesn't have to go over anymore, neither does Big Show. So use these guys to put over younger talent. And Brodus Clay needs that rub right now. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, like, you know, with John Cena is, you know, I... We all know he's going through a tough time right now with divorce and whatever else is going on. And I just think that maybe he should take some time off and just, you know, relax. And then, you know, come back. You know, let Big Show do or the hell they're planning on doing with him. And, you know, have him go against, you know, Brodus Clay and... Or even go after CM Punk, whatever. It's something to keep him busy. Because that way, when you take Cena off TV, you don't have all these fanboy marks going off about, oh, I'm tired of seeing him. I'm tired of seeing him every week. Because you don't see him. And that way, when he does come back, you're actually excited to see him. You know, because right now, I tell you, you know, I'm a fan of Randy Orton, but goddamn. Can I please have, like, a 12-month break from him? <laughs> Same with CM Punk. I am, you know, I'm at the point where, you know, yes, you're the world champion, whatever, but I don't need to see you all the time. And when he comes out there... It's never exciting to me because it's the same long, drawn-out promo. It's the same thing every week. And, you know, I just need a break. And now he's <laughs> like, on the cover of WWE 13. Oh, God. It's just, come on. Now, I, I will say, though, that that segment last night was pretty good. I, I did like that, where Laurinaitis came out there and revealed himself as the cover, cover child for, you know, the poster child for the video game. And then CM Punk came out there and set him straight. Uh, that was, you know, that was okay. Um, but I feel what you're saying. Do you realize, by the way, that CM Punk has been WWE champion for every bit of the last almost seven months? Am I mistaken Eesh. about that? I think he's been WWE champion for over 200 days now. Straight. Yeah. I, I just, you know, like I said before, I I was never a fan of his when he was in Ring of Honor and, you know, working the indies and stuff. I was never really a fan then, but it's just like now after the past year where we had that summer punk, which epically failed, and, you know, it's just felt like he's been pushed down our throats so much to the point where I'm ready to vomit. And <laughs> I'm just like, I don't, when I see CM Punk, okay, he's an average looking dude. He's got tattoos. He's straight edge. He doesn't drink or smoke. He's, you know, he's totally different from the typical male model looking WWE superstar that we always see all the time. Fine and dandy. But I just don't get what is the overall appeal, why everyone has a, like a freaking man crush on him. I don't get it. I don't see it in his promos. None of his promos has me hanging on the edge of my chair. If anything, they have me wanting to hit myself in the face of the chair. It, it just, I don't get it. I need a break from him. Well, there, there needs to be some new life breathed into both shows, I think. Um, honest to God, I think SmackDown's kind of got it together a little more than Raw does right now, even though both shows are just this massive, like I said, clusterfuck of, you know, crisscrossing feuds and, and, and or as Brodus Clay would say, you know, beef. I well, mean, see, it, I, I'm having a hard time see, figuring out who's who's pissed off with who and why now. Well, see, the thing is, I kind of like, you know, where they're doing the crisscrossing feuds of, you know, this guy from SmackDown feuding with this guy from Raw, this guy from Raw feuding with this guy from SmackDown. I'm fine with that, but my main issue is 
it's not consistent. Because where one week we're so used to one feud happening, the next week it's changed. And then, you know, they'll put it back on the next week, and then they change the next week, and then then you're confused because it's not consistent. And I kind of think that the E kind of shot themselves in the foot with this whole Raw Super Show thing because now you're getting all these feuds, especially if they're good feuds for SmackDown. They're throwing them on Raw, and they're exhausting the good stuff on Raw, and then when you turn on SmackDown... There's nothing good going on, or they're putting all the shit on Raw, and then you turn on SmackDown, and SmackDown's enjoyable. They're kind of shooting themselves in the foot because they're they are just not separating things like they used to anymore. Well, and, and that, that's I kind of see what I think they're trying to do is they're they're more or less trying to make Raw the true A show with all the good important shit on it, and I can see what they're trying to do on SmackDown now. You see all the new characters that are coming in go to SmackDown. Ryback, Antonio Cesaro, Damian Sandow. They've all gone to SmackDown. That's where all the new up-and-comers are at right now, you know? Mm -hmm. You're not going to see those guys on Raw until they can cut it on SmackDown. So they're basically what they've done is they've turned SmackDown into Thursday Night Thunder. (laughs) The problem with that is is let's look at what they're doing with Ryback and Sandow and Antonio Cesaro right now. Antonio Cesaro has not been on television in three weeks at all. He hasn't uh, been mentioned on television in several weeks. So he's basically become the Zack Ryder of SmackDown. Only difference is, is he can actually fucking really wrestle. And he's not on TV right now. And, I mean, okay, really all they had going with him anyway was a love triangle with Oksana and Teddy Long. Um, but Which I actually liked. Yeah. I, I, I don't like the love triangle, per se. I kind of like the pairing of him and Oksana. Yeah, I mean, that was fine with him and Oksana, but I just had a hard time buying Teddy Long in that whole triangle. I, but, I have know, a hard time buying that Teddy Long is into women. What are you talking about? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least without a baggie of blue pills. But anyway, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, but um, Damian Sandow came out to wrestle the other night and actually did wrestle a match for once. You know, he'd been talking his way out of him for a while now. Okay, again, and and I'm just going to touch on this again. The problem I have with Damian Sandow is is Legion at this point. All right, I have a problem with his whole fucking character right now. We've seen the smarmy, condescending, I am the savior of all that is good and holy character before. Jericho's done it. Um, fucking uh, uh, even CM Punk did it with the Straight Edge Society shit, you know, with the beard and the whole thing. We've seen this before. This is nothing new, and he's not even putting anything original on it, okay? The problem I have with Damian Sandow, he came out to wrestle the other night, and he did wrestle. He wrestled uh, uh, Funaki, I believe it was. Who? Right. <laughs> and he beat him with a Russian leg sweep and a neck breaker. Yeah. These are these are moves that most people use as a setup for something else. <laughs> he got in the ring, kicked him around a little bit, gave him a Russian leg sweep, hit him with a neck breaker, and then pinned him. And I'm like, that's the match? That's what this guy can do in the fucking ring? We're leaving Antonio Cesaro off TV and for this? A well, neck you, a Russian leg sweep? Yeah. Finishing moves in 1983. No, no. That was a finishing move in, like, 1958. What are you talking about? So how the hell am I supposed to buy Damian Sandow as a serious wrestler when he's winning with a neck breaker? Really? Are you shitting me? You know what? To be honest, I've actually seen worse on the independents. You know, I... I you know... I get what you're saying, the Russian blood sweep and then the neck breaker. You know, when you got, you know, the WWE where you're so used to seeing guys with power bombs as finishers or pile driver or pedigree or RKO, the AA, um, the 450 splash, the trouble in paradise. You've got all these moves that when you see them, you can believe that's a finishing move. And then you got 
the rushing leg sweep where I'm so used to that being the setup move or, you know, the move that gets you somewhere else. And then you got a neck breaker where, you know what? Layla has a like, neck breaker as her finisher. Like, it, what? It, but I'm so used to this one, the independence of just random ass moves. You know, I seriously remember seeing somebody use uh, an arm drag as a finisher. And, you know, I just don't get what they're doing with this guy. I kind of like the character, but again, like you said, we've seen this so many times. It's played. It's played. You know, it's played, and he's not even bringing out any stellar wrestling to offset that. I mean, at least if he came out there and really knocked my socks off with his wrestling moveset like Antonio Cesaro has, okay, fine. And while we're on the subject of, of new up-and-comers that don't seem to be going anywhere right now, what the fuck is up with Ryback? I mean, aside from the fact that he's a Goldberg knockoff, it's not even that good. And the reason why is because Goldberg actually started with Bill DeMott in WCW, okay? That was, or excuse me, Hugh Morris. Who? I mean, he at least started with somebody in WCW that was not necessarily a, a upper card player, but a guy that, you know, was a respectable wrestler and a trainer backstage and all that other shit, right? So yeah. Goldberg at least started with somebody half-ass legit and then worked his way up from there. All I've seen Ryback do is beat up on 164-pound local jobbers. And I mean, I don't mean they're local jobbers as in Vince puts them on TV so that they can get jobbed on SmackDown. I mean, I think they job in high school gyms. These guys get out there and they smart off a little bit. Ryback comes out there, he picks, you know, he, he picks his teeth with them and pins them, and that's it. And now he's gotten to where he's doing two at a time. Okay, that's fine. This has been going on for several, you know, for a couple of months now. Is this going anywhere? Is he eventually going to graduate to somebody that's actually, A, on the roster, you know? I mean, hell, put him out there with Alex Riley at least. Put him out there with with Zack Ryder at least. Somebody who, who fucking does this for a living. You know, don't be pulling people out of the dish room at, 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 at TGI Fridays. I mean, what the <laughs> fuck are we doing? My is issue is... Just... My issue with this whole Ryback thing is, like, one, first of all, <sighs> how many fucking big guys do we need in WWE? How many dudes do we need that... He's big, he's strong, he's dominating. How many guys do we need that in the WWE? We have so many of them. Two, we got this guy beating off little, like, two and three jobbers every week of with no names that no one knows who they are. When is somebody, like, I don't know, God damn it, like a Cody Rose or one of the guys in the back, when is somebody going to come out there and say, look, You've been beating off these guys for like 100 pounds every week. When are you going to come after one of us? Because if you can't come after one of us, then you don't deserve a spot here on this roster. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. I, I don't I don't, I don't, don't even understand this. I mean, we carve out four or five minutes every fucking week for him to come out there, beat the shit out of two local guys, pin them. And, and listen, his feats of strength are impressive. You know, he picked both of those guys up together last week and, and gave him his whatever the fuck that move is that he calls it. I mean, it's basically a Samoan drop. But, he, he, he you know, he, he gives them that, and then he stacks them on top of each other and pins them. Yeah, okay, you're strong. We get it. Are you going to go anywhere? Do you have any upward mobility? Are you ever going to be able to put asses in seats? Is anybody ever going to be sitting around on Monday Monday afternoon at work going, fuck, i got to get out of here. I can't wait to go see Ryback wrestle tonight. Is that ever going to happen? No. And it's not going to happen for Antonio Cesaro. Sorry, all you Ring of Honor fans out there. It's not going to happen for for Damian Sandow. Who? So so why? Why are they even on the roster? My issue, you know, like what you said of Antonio Cesaro or, as I just say, Claudia Casanoli. That's who I know him by. You know, I, I love Claudio Castanoli for, you know, other reasons, but I Easy. love <laughs> I I can't resist him in his accent. I can't help it. But 
I enjoy watching him in a ring and you know I enjoy watching Chris Hero who's down in FCW right now but you know when I found out they got signed I was sad because I'm like okay maybe they need to leave Ring of Honor it's time for them to do something else but in the back of my mind I'm like okay they're signed do I actually see WWE actually doing something with these guys? Not really. And maybe I'm being negative about it, but it's just maybe it's because I watched these guys for so long. And I've seen this done so many fucking times with so many guys come off the independence. WWE signs them. Everybody gets excited. And what happens? Next day, you know, a couple months later, he's canned. It, it, I mean, the only guy we've seen recently that's gone past that is CM Punk. Well, and Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan, a little bit. But same thing with happened with him. He got fired after a couple months, and then they buried him on NXT. They made him look like he couldn't wrestle. You know, they made him look like a joke for the longest time. And then mm-hmm. you got Evan Bourne, who I don't even know is even employed anymore. You know, they do well, this with so many of the guys... Quit. So it's disappointing. That's because Daniel Bryan can't quit hitting the endo. <laughs> I mean, not <laughs> Daniel Bryan, but um, Evan Bourne. You know, he, he's yeah. going to have to put down the bong if he ever wants to make it in that company. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Um, yeah, so it's just like, I don't even know what they're going to do with them. What I'm hearing you say is that Chris Hero's in FCW right now, so there's more of this coming? Yeah, it's Chris Hero's coming. Tyler Black is coming. Okay. Um, Ricky Steamboat's son, uh, Richie Steamboat, who's been, he's worked in Japan for years before he came over here. Does he have the goods? Richie? Yeah. <sighs> he's not Ricky, but he's, he's pretty impressive. And I think if they actually take the time and give this kid some more seasoning, he could be up there. Big star. Okay. Um, well, they got the so way, many kids down there. They're so good. They're just I just know they're not going to do, do anything with them. Well, the one thing I will give Vince McMahon credit for is that being a legacy does not automatically guarantee you success in the company. Okay, yeah. the Rock, okay, the Rock got over, but the Rock made that happen for himself. You know, uh, Randy Orton got over, but he made that happen for himself. Yeah, and he had some help from being tutored by and, and mentored by Triple H and Ric Flair. I mean, I get that. But he did all the right, I mean, he was a shithead early in his career, but the guy's gotten his shit together, he's a family man now, and he's serious about the business, and he's made his own career, okay? You may be sick of him now, but the guy's a legit star in this business. Uh, yeah. Cody Rhodes is doing things the right way right now, I think. Now, it's kind of sad to see him just absolutely lost in the Intercontinental title picture over and over again. It's kind of like watching that movie Groundhog Day, you know? But... um being a legacy does not automatically give you success in this business. Jimmy Snuka's no. have not made it. I mean, let's just call it what it is. You know? Yeah. Neither I mean, one of them at, made it in this business. Um, well, look at um, Perfect Teddy, Son. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's another good example. Uh, Ted DiBiase Jr. is not making it in this business. It's just that I think a lot of people don't realize, that, you know, yeah, when you find out your favorite superstar has a kid and you get excited because like, you're like, oh, my God, I wonder if they're going. You know, the question is out there. I wonder if they're going to be anything close to their father or their mother, which is bad to compare them to, you know, their parents or their siblings. Because if you don't have it in your heart, you're not going to be anywhere near that. And by the way, David Flair has been on milk cartons for about the last 13 years. Dear Jesus, and speaking of the Flairs. You know what? (laughs) Ric Flair, I respect you because for some goddamn reason, all your kids want to be in the business. You had David. We can't find him. I don't know where he is. Um, Reed. Reed, And now your daughter wants to be a wrestler. Oh, no. Please, God, no. And Dada E signed her. Oh, Jesus, no. And she hadn't even gotten a ring at all. Oh, my God. Yeah, so yes, yes. hopefully she'll. Well, I mean, why the hell not, though? I, and just... I hate to say this, but the Divas, the Divas division basically consists of Kelly Kelly, Eve Torres, and Layla L right now. 
you know, the Divas division is like... I'm sorry, not Eve Torres. I meant Beth Phoenix, not Eve Torres. So you have Kelly Kelly, Beth Phoenix, and Layla. Those, that's, that's your Divas division when it comes to wrestling. You know, you talked about AJ earlier. Um, the fact is, she's, 90, she's like 95 pounds. She's not going to wrestle Beth Phoenix believably, ever. It's not going to no. happen. Okay, so they have no choice but to give her this side angle as a crazy, crazy, you know, sort of hand that rocks the cradle type girlfriend or single white female, if you will. I mean, they they have no choice but to do this with her. Um, Eve Torres, she's making it work as an administrative, you know, whatever the fuck she is, executive administrator now. All right. She's wearing that role. Well, I'm buying that, you know. So what, yeah. basically what Vince is doing is he's having to find other things to do with these divas because he recognizes their, their value on television, but he knows he can't get, he, he's not going to get a good wrestling match out of Eve Torres. He's just not. He's not going to no. get a good wrestling match out of AJ. You know? Well, Hell, well, he, I, don't, I don't think the thing is like with AJ is, I mean, yes, she's small, you know, very small girl. And, you know, no, she's not going to pin Beth Phoenix realistically, but I mean, for heaven's sakes, Kelly Kelly did it, and Kelly Kelly's only got like about 10 pounds on her. But I think they could have done something with AJ, just have her as the baby face, like they had her the smiley go lucky. I look like I'm 14, but I'm actually 24. Girl, they get squashed every now and then. They could have yeah. did that with her. But instead, now she's psychopath. Kelly Kelly, I, you know. I don't know what's going on with her. That horrible match last week. Rosa Mendez is not doing anything. Uh, Alicia Fox really not doing anything. No. Nope. Beth Phoenix is all of a sudden now angry. Natalia Neidhart is not doing a damn thing. Tamina Snuka, somebody find her. Maxine yeah, is you. stuck on NXT. It's just like, what the fuck is going on? She, she and Zack Ryder are driving, you know, driving the, the missing persons bus right now. Uh, I mean, yeah. And by the way, you know, I can make a case. Yeah, the, the Divas division does have a real problem with just ignoring people and just basically making them disappear. Um, but we, we've got a, quite a few male wrestlers doing the same thing. And, and some of it is because there's just simply not enough screen time for them. Like, really? Okay, Zack Ryder was backstage yeah. last night, but he didn't make it on TV. But where the hell were you going to put him? Last night was the big show show. Yeah. You know, he took up the first half hour of the show. He took up the last half hour of the show. And the show was only two hours long. Half that show last night was the big show. But the thing is, with Zack Ryder is, you know, I haven't really been paying attention to SmackDown and Superstars the past couple weeks. But I haven't really even seen him on there. Yeah, it's pretty sad when he he's not even you know he's not even getting on the internet shows anymore. And you know, it's seriously, people. I said this months ago when everybody was kissing his ass because he had an internet show and he was going to be the big thing. And I said, in a couple of months, we will not fucking see Zack Ryder. And, and look, right. yes. So everybody needs to pucker up. <laughs> Because I told you, I've I've seen this stuff done so many fucking times. Hell, when even Alex Riley's getting TV time to get his face pushed into a wall by Big Show and Zack Ryder TV and, and television. And speaking of that, what in the hell? A year ago, Alex Riley was feuding with The Miz. And now he's Big Show's face plant? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> It kind of reminded me of Kevin Nash lawn darting Rey Mysterio into the side of a production trailer. In oh, WCW. God. You said that, and I pictured that right in my head. Like, <laughs> Oh, but hey, here's good news. Sin Cara's coming back next week. Ah. Uh, Everybody hear the cricket uh, chirping there? Right. Well, CR, we're, we're, we're getting kind of long in the tooth on this show, so I guess we better get down to the one topic that I've been itching to talk about since last week. And Who, that Lesner? is no, not Brock Lesnar. Um, incidentally, I did have a note here about Brock Lesnar that I wanted to share, and that is that he was at UFC 146 this past Saturday night, where Junior Dos Santos absolutely destroyed Frank Mir. 
which I knew he was going to do because I've seen Brock Lesnar destroy Frank Mir most of two times. I watched Shane Carwin destroy Frank Mir, and it seems like all Frank Mir has to do to keep getting UFC heavyweight title shots is beat Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira and then just sit around and wait for his turn. That's pretty much all he has to do. Okay? Yeah. He's beaten, he's beaten uh, Minotaro Nogueira twice, and both times he's gotten title shots because of it. Um, great. Okay. So, Junior Dos Santos absolutely destroyed him Saturday night. The interesting note about that, though, is that there was a person in attendance by the name of Brock Lesnar. He was at UFC, and in the post-fight press conference on Saturday night, Dana White was asked by journalists, is Brock Lesnar contemplating a return? And Dana White simply smiled and said, that's a possibility, and then went on to the next question. Hmm. Somebody and then that gets here. everyone, and then that gets everyone stirred up to thinking that he's leaving and going to UFC, and you know. Well, yeah, yeah sure, I, sure. Brock Lesnar returning to UFC is a possibility. It's also a possibility that he'll challenge Barack Obama for the Democratic National uh, race um, here in sure. uh, August. Yeah, but here, here's my thing, though, Kev. I'm glad you jumped in on this, because why would Dana White have a stake in playing out one of Vince McMahon's storylines? They notoriously don't do business together. That's what they tell us. Be- because like, it- they notoriously make sure, and then Dana White has absolutely no vested interest in getting in bed with WWE. No. None. Because he is still, listen, UFC is a legitimate sport now, and everybody buys into it. But the last thing he needs is to be associated with a scripted product because it's going to get people to thinking that maybe he does that shit and he doesn't need that exposure. So why would Dana White have any interest at all in in advancing one of Vince McMahon's storylines? It's because it's not advancing Vince McMahon's storyline. It's people talking about Brock Lesnar returning to UFC. Any press about UFC is good press. Yes, Yes and no. I mean, I... I personally think there is a chance Lesnar is going to come back. You know, nobody retires from something at 32 years of age. I'm sorry, I mean, they don't. Yeah, not even Mike Thomas Brown, who did announce his retirement, and now a couple of days later is reconsidering it. Exactly, and BJ Penn's coming back. I mean, nobody retires at that age. So when Brock Lesnar said in January, after he got his ass whipped, or February, or whenever that was, after he got his ass whipped that you wouldn't see him in a UFC cage again, my immediate thought was bullshit. Okay, That's what is bullshit. this? Okay, I don't really watch UFC unless Josh Koscheck is on. Um, I agree with both of you, but at the same time, you know, Paul Heyman did the whole same thing too of where he's not dealing with WWE. He doesn't, you know, we're not associated with him and look what happened. But, and another thing is, what is this with Brock Lesnar of every time he gets his ass beat? He has to walk away. Like he's oh. contemplating life. That is so freaking feminine. Like what? That was actually the very, very promo that Triple H cut three weeks ago, by the way. That is so woman like. That was the what? exact That was the exact promo that Triple H cut several weeks ago, and that's why I said that, that was not that was not a, a work. I think he was shooting all over Brock Lesnar with that promo. I really do. You know, back in 2004, things got tough for you, and you walked. Then you went yeah. to UFC. Then you went and tried out for the Minnesota Vikings and couldn't make it there. Then you went to UFC. You won their title. Then you got your ass beat, and you walked. Now you're back here. John Cena beats you, and now you're walking again. And you know something? I, honest to God, am starting to wonder, are WWE fans about to get fucked again by Brock Lesnar? And I think that the possibility is there, and I think Dana White is salivating at the idea of bringing back the biggest draw he's ever had. But you know, it kind of if that is going to happen, if he does decide to return to USC, I mean, I don't, I don't really care. He can return to bumfuck for all I care, because I don't care. But... The thing is, that's going to piss me off, even though I'm not really a fan of his, I never was a fan, is one, 
you had Dada E get all excited about having you back and they signed you to this freaking contract with all this fucking money and then you just one day just decide you know I am really tired of carrying that purse and you go and get a new purse and just move on with your life like a fucking woman what if that is going to happen then you know that's really that's a low blow to the guys in the back that are there every day out of the year like John Cena and you know Randy Orton and all the mid car guys, the jobbers. That's a low blow. Right. And Brock Lesnar really does only give a shit about Brock Lesnar. I mean, we all know that. You know, that's just that's just who he is. He's gonna go where the money's the fattest and he's gonna go where the job is the easiest. And I got news for him. After what I saw Junior Dos Santos do to Frank Mir the other night, there's no way Brock Lesnar's ever gonna beat him in a match. He's never going to beat Cain Velasquez yeah. in a match. It's not going to happen. I mean, Alistair Overeem destroyed him. Cain Velasquez destroyed him. Shane Carwin was on his way to destroying him when Lesnar got his shit together and pulled, you know, pulled it out. But Brock Lesnar has had all the success I think he's ever going to have in UFC. And if I'm him, I don't even go that road again. You know, maybe the thing is, is that the guy just he just doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. And so he, he, he's jerking everybody around in the process trying to figure that out. Okay, well, that's fine. But I, I just I thought it was very interesting that not only was he at UFC, though, and, and that in and of itself, by the way, doesn't mean jack shit. Undertaker goes to those things all the time. You know? Um, the Rock goes to those things all the time. So Batista goes to those things. I mean, WWE superstars and former WWE superstars going to those things is not in and of itself news, Okay. But Brock Lesnar, being the former UFC World Heavyweight Champion, sitting in that crowd, and then Dana White refusing to deny that there was a strong possibility that he could make a return to the octagon, I thought was not good news for WWE. Because I don't think that that's something that he and Vince cooked up together. Now, I think no, Vince is that's a smart the thing, enough businessman. Like... I think Vince is a smart enough businessman that he'll figure out how to use that, but I don't think that that was intended. Yeah, but if you're in WWE's position of, okay, Brock shows up at UFC, whatever number it is, like, because I don't watch it, he shows up and then all of a sudden he's having a change of heart, like a woman, or the show, and he decides, I want to be in the UFC, and then you, the WWE, you sign him to this contract, and all of a sudden, he decides he wants to pull out of this contract. So then that's just egg on your face, because you assigned this guy to all this money. And now what do you do? What do you tell your fans of, wow, we brought in this guy who was beating up John Cena every week, busted, gave him bloody nose and everything, and now he doesn't want to be here. Right, and as a fan of both UFC and WWE, I just think that's total horse shit. I, I, yeah. do. I don't think you can do both. I don't think Dana White would ever go for Brock Lesnar being WWE and UFC because, simply put, first of all, th those two things take completely different training regimens, and second of all, Brock Lesnar or Dana White is not going to watch Brock Lesnar get injured doing WWE when he's got all this money invested in him. Bottom line. So that anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that, that was just a curious development. Um, right quick before we sign off, we need to talk about Chris Jericho. And the bottom line is he he was in Brazil this past week for some WWE shows they were putting on, and he decided to go major heel on the crowd, and he apparently took a Brazilian national flag, threw mm -hmm. it on the ground, stomped on it, desecrated the thing, to the point where the policeman in the arena stopped the show, stopped the live show, and told him he would either apologize or go to jail. Like, yeah. fuck your showmanship, fuck kayfabe, fuck all that. You just desecrated our flag, dude, and we don't play that shit down here. So, Ciara, before I unload on this, I want to get your thoughts on this matter. You know, 
I understand that wrestlers, especially if they're playing heels, they like to play it up to the crowd and, you know, the whole kayfabe thing and everything. But I just think that, no, I'm not, you know, patriotic and everything, but when it comes to taking a country's flag and, you know, you're disrespecting it and throwing it on the ground, balling it up and spitting on it and kicking it and, you know, doing all that stuff like that. Yeah, you might think it's just showmanship as you're being a heel and you're going to piss off the crowd. But at the same time, you can't do that because where that's okay here in the United States, yeah, some people are going to get mad, but no one's going to sit up and arrest you. You go to another country... You're going to be thrown in jail for life for stuff like that. You can't do that. I just think that sometimes when you're being a heel, you got to think about things and you got to think of the consequences. And I think Jericho was doing it as just a showmanship, no harm, but look what happened. You almost got arrested, dude. Yeah, and the thing is, is, is here in the United States, you have a First Amendment right to desecrate the American flag. Yeah. Just do, and that's been upheld in court after court. I don't personally like it. I mean, anybody who's friends with me on Facebook sees what I do for a living, and they understand why I would have strong feelings about something like that. Okay, but even setting aside my own personal feelings about what I, how I would react to somebody doing that to the American flag, because everybody was quick to point out, well, Sergeant Slaughter and the Iron Sheik did that to the American flag back in 1991. Uh, okay, whatever. First of all, like I said, you have the constitutional right to do that in this country. You do not have the right to do that in Brazil, particularly if you're not from Brazil. And yeah. my contention is is that I get that Chris Jericho is an over-the-top heel and he does whatever he can to incite crowds and he uses Twitter to, you know, to to work people and I understand his character. I understand what he's doing with his character. I, I get it, all right? What I don't understand is how a guy who honed his craft, who literally became the Lionheart Chris Jericho by wrestling in Japan, Germany, and Mexico, as well as Canada and the United States, okay? This guy has, 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 has honed his craft in literally a half dozen countries around the globe. He has wrestled all over the place. Even apart from his wrestling career, he has toured with his band Fozzie all over Europe, all over Asia. The guy has traveled this entire fucking globe entertaining people for over two decades now. Yeah. How do you not know better than to do this? How in the fuck did it not occur to you that this might not be cool? Yeah, it's, but the thing is, like, you know, like you were saying about the Iron Sheik and you know, Sergeant Slaughter doing it. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing, but at the same time, there's a difference. Here in the United States, there, you know, there's about maybe about five people that believe wrestling is real. You know, where the rest of us know it's just storylines, we know it's not actual factual. In Brazil and other countries, doing anything to the flag is, like you said, it's against the law. And you know, down in Brazil and even over in Japan, down in Mexico and stuff, they still believe wrestling is real. So when you take and, you know, grab their flag of their country and do something like that, that's like, you know, like a, <gasps> how dare you? Yeah, and that's, that's actually a great point you just made. There is a big difference between Sergeant Slaughter and the Iron Sheik in the United States offending a live crowd, okay? In a country where it's understood that when you leave that arena, we get it. They're not ri Sergeant Slaughter was a United States Marine, okay? We understand that he doesn't yeah. really hate America, even though he was playing that character at the time. People know that he when he when he takes off those tights and puts on his jeans and leaves the arena, that he's still a patriotic, proud American. It's a character he's playing, okay? And all he yeah. did that night was piss off that crowd. All right? Chris Jericho offended a nation. Maybe not every single person who lives in Brazil, but he, if, he offended a nation that night. Because like you said, they don't have the same 
detached, you know, they don't have the same detached no. uh, detachment that we do to wrestling. We get the whole kayfabe aspect. We get that it's scripted. We get that it's a show. Down there, that shit's real to them. Especially in a place like Japan, he would have never fucking pulled that in Japan. Oh, God. If he did that in Japan, he would be blackballed from the whole entire country. Well, but okay. he understands the culture of Japan, and he understands their nationalistic yeah. pride. Okay? So, what made him think Brazil was different? What made him think that Brazil would be cool with that, especially when they actually have federal laws against this? Okay. Well, so, let, 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 let me jump in here. Um, you, you can theorize about this, however... I'm not theorizing. I'm telling you what I know about the man himself. He said it in his own book. Okay, well, I'm talking about the situation specifically in Brazil here. If you go and watch the videos that are on YouTube, there's a reason why he thinks he can get away with it, because he did. Because the reaction of that crowd was the same that would happen right here in America. He went and he took the flag and he balled it up and he kicked it out of the ring and the fans booed and then they immediately started chanting for CM Punk. They didn't go bum rush that ring because he now insulted their national pride and he broke no, a federal law and, and they're ready to start a riot over it because he started an international incident. They reacted like wrestling fans. Yeah, you're right, Kevin. The, the, the crowd did not storm the ring. The fucking cops did. The fucking cops stopped the show. Yes. They stopped the show and told him, you will either apologize and leave this country immediately, or we're hauling your ass to prison. Kev, yeah. you, you failed to account for that little that little detail. Okay, no, the crowd didn't jump the barricades and storm the ring. The fucking cops did. They were, they were ready to haul his ass to jail for what he did. Okay, and from all the accounts that I've actually read, the cops were actually very cool about it. They said, you know, look, you, you did this offense in public. And it's considered a serious offense. However, here's what we're going to do. If you apologize, life goes on. No, that's not exactly what happened. They said, if you apologize, and then we escort your ass to the airport, and you leave our country immediately, life goes on. They threw him out of Brazil. reason why the Miz had to replace him the rest yeah. of the tour. They didn't just stop the show, make him apologize, and then went, okay, all's forgiven. They literally made him leave the country over this. He had to get on an airplane and fucking leave Brazil because right, of what because he did. They, right, and it was either they, that or go to jail. Right, because they didn't want to take him to jail. And they didn't want to have to fill out the paperwork because nobody really considers it a big deal except for the damn politician who put the law in place to begin with. I disagree with that, Kevin. I don't know. I, I can't think of another time in the history. And listen, I've only been watching wrestling for 27 years, okay? I can't think of another single time that I've ever heard of where cops went down to the ring, stopped a fucking show told a performer to apologize to the crowd, and then escorted his ass down to the airport and threw him out of their country. I have never in my life heard of that happening before. I mean, I never really heard of that, especially with shoot interviews. I've heard of incidents where the cops were waiting for the guy when the show was over or ready to cuff him backstage and stuff like that. But, you know, for the the cops to walk out there during the show, that's kind of like... Well, you know, like Jesus, but at the same time, Brazil is Brazil is weird. No, it's not weird. Brazil is very. How would you say? Some of the politicians well, Brazil, in they, Brazil they are have very... certain laws that here in the United States, even to over in Japan and other countries, we would think are fucking crazy. They are very strict with their laws. They're they're. Some of the laws in Brazil are very nationalistic. That, that's what it comes well, down to. Yes. You know, and, and a lot of those countries think we're weird because we don't allow public nudity on tele on, on, or nudity on public television. You know, England thinks we're weird because we don't we don't allow tits on sitcoms. You know, I mean, it. The thing is, is Brazil isn't weird. Brazil is Brazil, and yeah. you've got to know that if you're going to go down there and you're going to entertain the people of Brazil and you're going to take their money for doing it, that you've got to fucking know not to do that. And at, 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 at least I'm proposing, and I think probably something's going to come from this, that the company needs to hire somebody or make it someone's responsibility to go find out the quickest way to piss a crowd off and then fucking tell their people not to do that. Well, somebody should have done that already because in, anywhere that WWE goes, WWE themselves are technically not in, in charge of the show. Even here in the United States, for, in every state, WWE has hired somebody to represent them 
to run the show because they can't actually be in every state. They can't have a real employee in every state. That's just too fucking expensive. And, and same thing goes around the world. You, well, you, but they've they got get, traveling road agents. I mean, they've got people backstage. That, right. You well, know. well, what I'm saying is they, they, they hire somebody local who's supposed to know everything, who's supposed to have everything lined up. You know, in mo- like here in the United States, you know, usually in every state where they're representing running a show, they've got a lawyer there that they hire who's supposed to be up on all the laws and everything. Whoever their agent was that they hired to be able to get a show license in Brazil should have been up on this. Now, now the bottom line is, do I think Chris Jericho should be fired and, and, and ostracized and blackballed and his whole career fucked over the thing? No, not necessarily. Well, okay? then, see, my thing is... You know, because I have two points here is, you know, yeah, maybe they should have somebody that's there locally that knows Brazil and knows all the crazy laws and everything explain to everybody, like, look, you can't do this, can't do that. Okay, maybe, who knows, you never know, maybe somebody did do that and maybe Jericho said, you know, fuck this, we're still going to do this. Who knows? And then another thing is, you know, with this whole flag incident, yes, Brazil's different from the United States. They take the whole flag thing seriously. It, but, you know, a few months ago, we had F- Finley get fired for, you know, being an agent of a show where The Miz came out there and, you know. Up to the national anthem, yeah. Yeah, and he got fired over that, and Jericho goes out there and disgraces a flag and he gets sent home and then the guy that replaces him is the guy that fucked up somebody else's job <laughs> you get what i'm saying like yeah i do it's and, just and like it's really just ironic and i'm kind of like so bottom line, that right? <laughs> bottom line is chris jericho suspended for 30 days um by the way that's the same suspension you get for a drug bust in wwe for, for a first-time offense of the wellness policy in WWE. Um, I don't know if that's harsh enough quite. Like I said, I'm not looking to, you know, take the whole guy, the, the guy's whole 20-year career on that one thing. I do think it was a completely fucked, boneheaded mistake. I, I think it was something he should have known better than to do. I think it's something that they should have all been coached on before they got there. I think from now on they're going to take steps to make sure shit like that never happens again. Um, The one thing I don't want to see come out of this is Chris Jericho come out there and wipe his ass with what he did when he finally comes back. And I'm already seeing him doing that on Twitter, acting like he's, 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 and uh, yeah, Kev, I get it. He's making chicken soup out of chicken shit, whatever. The thing is, is he, he, he fucked up. He just fucked up. And sometimes you just got to be a man and own that. Okay. And I don't want to see them turn us into some silly ass angle where Jericho basically mocks, you know, the punishment he got, mocks what happened, and he's already starting to do that on Twitter, and that fucking bothers me. Because the whole purpose of an apology is to admit you did something wrong and ask for forgiveness for it, right? And then what should come out of that apology is that you never fucking do that again. But the bottom line to all of that is the thread that runs right through all three of those components is you've got to recognize that you fucked up. You've got to own it. And he's not owning this thing. I don't care what he yeah. said to the live crowd. Bottom line is he had to say that to the live crowd or they were going to haul his ass to jail. That guy got out there and he tap danced real fast to make sure they would at least get his ass down to the airport so he could fly back to Tampa, Florida. Okay? But the bottom line is, is whether he meant that to the live crowd or not, I'm not even going to get into a debate about that. But what I'm already seeing him do on Twitter is he's already starting to mock this whole thing like he really didn't think it was all that big a deal in the first place and like everybody else is fucking stupid for expecting better than this from him. And I don't like that. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't want to get mad at Jericho and be like, God, you you know, because I've heard other shows go off about Jericho being an asshole and, you know, I don't want to do that to him, but it's, it just kind of puzzles me because I'm like, you, maybe you didn't know this was a law down there and everything, but for you to just not own up to this and be like, look, I'm sorry, and you're just still carrying on, like, the same asshole you've been doing every day, it it just kind of bothers me, like, you know, come on, just be like, you know, I'm sorry. Stop being a heel. It just pisses me off because it's like, 
I know he's being a heel. I know he likes to troll on his Twitter and all that stuff. But God damn it, sometimes you being a fucking heel and being an asshole, you've got to cut that shit out and be human. And, yeah, and the bottom line is sometimes you just got to unplug the show and go, you know what, hold on a second, guys. Let's just set the character aside for a minute, and let me just admit I fucked up. I fucked up. I should not have done this. I really am sorry. That will never happen again. Please accept my humblest apologies. And then if you want to pick the heel persona back up and roll on from there, that's fine. Call time in and go back to your game. Just leave that shit alone. Leave that whole situation alone. Him out, him, him using Twitter to make light of this whole thing is basically taking that apology that he gave to the Brazilians and wiping his ass with it and, and sticking it to the wall and saying, this is what I had to do to get out of your country. I didn't really mean that. I just had to say this so that I could get out of the hot water I was in at that moment. Because now he's trying to turn it into a whole fucking angle, and I don't appreciate that at all. Yeah, I and just... that's on behalf of, 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 of a country I've never been to and probably never will go to. I just know how I would feel if somebody from Brazil came here and did that to the fucking American flag. Yeah, well, see, I'm looking at the Angry March chat room. Um, Lucky in the chat room says, I understand what he did was wrong, okay, but I still think it's a work. And that's sad that this whole thing is is a work. We're looking at this as a work. You think he he you think he did this? You think Vince had him go out there and stomp all over a Brazilian flag so that he could spend him for thirty days and turn this into a work? He was already in a feud with somebody. He didn't need to work anything, you know. And then, by the way, you talked about Randy Orton. He was in a feud with Randy Orton. Well, now what? Now Randy Orton's RKOing the Miz. Because what the hell else does he have to do right now while Jericho's sitting, you know, sitting in detention hall? Yeah, I, I just, I wouldn't necessarily say this is the work. And, you know, that's another thing. I think us wrestling fans have gotten in the habit of always saying something in the news is a work. Especially when we don't. Chris Jericho. Yeah, especially when it involves a heel or a Chris Jericho or something like that. It, you know, folks, like, who knows? But I know it's a goddamn law down there that you can't take their flag and, you know, be disrespectful. I know it's a law. So for the cops storming out there, you know, yeah, that's that's a law. And, you know, to answer Stevie J's question, um, this is off topic, Um the Jillian Hall arrest is actually a month old. She was actually arrested April 23rd, so I don't know why that's all of a sudden in the news. Jillian Hall got arrested? What? Yeah, for domestic violence. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, I guess I can't... Well, I don't know whether that would surprise me or not. I just... I didn't even hear anything about that. Maybe it's because she's not relevant anymore. Well, actually, I heard something about it a month ago, like she got arrested, but no one said, like, what for. And then today, it just came out like, oh, she got arrested for domestic violence. And I'm like, okay, so I'm reading it, and I'm like, you know, I do my research. And I'm like, okay, she got arrested more than a month ago. Why is this all of a sudden, you know, in the news? And Oh, I know why. I know why. It's I mean, I know that, she's getting another divorce. No, child. It, it's because on Saturday, and uh, you, you know, UF, UFC ring girl Ariana, uh-huh. yes, she got arrested early Saturday morning on a domestic <laughs> violence charge. Yes, she did. So I bet you that's why it's come up now. Maybe, but <sighs> and somebody's trying to tie a thread between them. I get it. Yeah, but still. <laughs> Put this whole thing with Chris Jericho to bed. The bottom line is, is what we're trying to do as American wrestling fans is we're trying to take our American sensibilities and apply it to how the Brazilians should have felt about it. And whether, you know, and whether you think it should have been a law or not is you being an American and filtering that whole thing through your American sensibility, okay? Because here in the United States, it's not a crime to desecrate the flag. Hell, in some in some circles, it's encouraged, okay? Mm-hmm. So... We're taking that American sensibility and we're trying to filter how the Brazilians should have felt through what we know to be the truth here in the United States or what we know to be the law here in the U.S. 
You cannot do that. If you're going to go try to appeal to another culture with your brand of entertainment, you have to respect that culture in doing so. And Chris Jericho has said that himself in his in one of I don't remember which one it was, but one of his two autobiographies, he actually said that himself that he had a hard time at first connecting with the Japanese crowds because he didn't understand their culture. He didn't understand why yeah. he was putting on all these aerial feats of, of you know, of, of athletic prowess, and they were just sitting there quietly, and it didn't seem like they really appreciated him. That's just their culture, okay? And once he finally understood what their culture was, he finally understood how to entertain them, and when he understood how to entertain them, that's really when he became a star. That's when the, the whole thing about the business itself clicked in his head. He fucked up on this one. Ordinarily, his comedic instincts and ordinarily his instincts for running a heel to the to the top of the flagpole or running a face to the top of the flagpole are spot on. He fucked up on this one. Bottom line. He did yeah. not respect the culture. He did not respect the people down there. He fucked up on this one. So I'm tired of people trying to excuse this. I'm tired of people saying it was no big deal or it was just an angle or it's just Chris Jericho being a heel. To say that, basically tells the Brazilian people, fuck you, you're wrong. And you can't do that when it happened in Brazil. Yeah. They are not uh, wrong because it was in their backyard and we pissed them off and they have every right to be. Same as if somebody came into your backyard and started pissing on your rose bushes, okay? Not you know, my roses. Right in the world to be pissed off when somebody offends you on your turf. That's it, bottom line. Chris Jericho fucked up. And for those of you who a hard time understanding why it's a big deal it's because you're not from brazil yeah That's they it. they take that whole you know most countries where here in the united states you know some people don't get pissed off about you know certain people doing things with the flag or being unpatriotic and other countries if you're not patriotic you can be just sent to jail easily like there's been you know, things in the news like that where people have been sent to jail for having their own beliefs. And, I mean, I don't know how WWE is going to clean this up. <laughs> but well, There's a difference between your town sucks heat like we get all the time, you know, when somebody comes out and makes fun of the local team or whatever. There's a difference between the your town sucks heat and the your country, your race, and your whole sucks he that Chris Jericho tried to incite the other night you just can't do that and now he gets the point I, I just wish he wasn't being such a smart ass about it now yeah you know well, see yeah we got a question um, yes from Nickel um, from Nikolai the host of Smackdown rundown um he asked me a couple of days ago question for both of us he says with all the mistakes being brought to our attention, and they are so, there are so many these days, are Lillian Garcia's botches intentional? I don't know, but I kind of noticed that on SmackDown the other night, too. She screwed up a couple times, and the interesting thing about that is, is that's an edited show. Like, they have a chance to go back post-production and clean that up. Well, see, um, Over the Limit, after Over the Limit, this story came out. That her and, um, what's his name, Justin Roberts? Yeah. Um, apparently they got to arguing at ringside over ring announcing. And somebody said they overheard him saying, well, you've been making a lot of mistakes lately. Well, Justin came out and shot that down, said that's not true and whatever. But I have nothing against Lillian Garcia, but ever since she's returned, I don't know, maybe it's because the time off or... Maybe she just doesn't really want to ring announce anymore. Ever since she's came back, she has been fumbling and botching terribly. She's even been falling on the way to the, you know, to ringside. And I don't know what's going on. Uh, it, it, it almost comes across like her heart's just not in it anymore. You know, like she's just doing it to be doing it now. Yeah, and it, and the thing that gets me is... She botches stuff on guys that she's been working around since she's been there. Yeah. Like Christian and stuff like that. And I'm like, you should know his weight and height by heart with your eyes closed. Right. You I, know? I, re I really think a part of, I really think a big part of her missed the business when she was gone. 
And so she made the decision. And, and I think, by the way, that this could also be said of Brock Lesnar. Okay. I think it probably sounded like a better idea than it wound up being. Yeah. And, and, and the bitch of it is with Lesnar, everybody kind of expected that. Everybody expected yeah. to come back and, you know, once he started getting involved again and having to travel and shit going, yeah, why did I do this? Um, because Lillian Garcia is, is basically window dressing to these shows. And by the way, any, any ring announcer is, I'm not just picking her out because of, you know, the fact that she's a female. Justin Roberts is, is window dressing. You know, Tony Schimmel was, was window dressing. Uh, it just, when you're a ring announcer, you're basically, you're there to provide flavor to the product, you know? Yeah. And, if, if she were, if she had a more important role in what was going on, it would be more obvious. Like when Mike Adamley was the GM of Raw. You know, oh. that, that was just god awful and everybody knew it immediately and he had to go. But with her, I, I just, I think that she came back thinking that this was going to be cool again and it was going to be like old times. And then she came back and went, um, yeah, why did I do this? And she's struggling now because I don't think her heart's in it. Well, she's, you know, if she's not happy being there, then, honey, turn in your pink slip. Yeah, do us all a favor. You know, that it's just as simple. I mean, they it's could bring back crazy. Tony Schimmel. I would be fine with that. Hell, bring Who? back Howard Finkel. I would like to think, but that's not happening. No, he's, he's, he's way too old for that. But anyway, um, by the way, we actually had one more question that was sent in an email. Uh-oh. And I'm going to read this, and it totally off the subject, but still a good question, I think, especially mm-hmm. for a WCW fan. Oh, God. Yeah. We had a question from a guy named Matt, and this was it. He says, hello, Frank and Ciara. I'm enjoying all of your Tuesday night AMPs. You both are great. My question is, do you think that the WWE Network Cruiserweight show will become a success, or will it flop? Will the superstars who are on this show get a chance to be on the Raw and SmackDown brands, or will they always be in that WWE Network show? So apparently the WWE Network, when they finally manage to get around to actually being a network, is going to be uh, featuring a Cruiserweight show. Now, I don't know what your feeling is about Cruiserweight wrestling, but I have some rather strong emotions about the thing. Um, see, my thing is, you know, like you said, we've been told about this WWE Network was supposed to be coming, and then they pushed it back, and then apparently no one knows that this is coming for sure, and then there's been these rumored shows about this Cruiserweight show, and, like, again, no one knows that this is for sure, like, certain that this is going to happen. I... See, the thing is, I don't want to be mean to the small people, but I like the Cruiserweights. They have a place sometimes on a show, but a whole show dedicated to them? No. I'm sorry, but this... WCW tried this with, you know... When they went to Thunder and they tried to have almost everything based around the cruiserweights. And then they had, what the hell was it? They had the other show on Saturday night where it was based around the cruiserweights and that didn't go anywhere. And then Dota ES actually has tried this before years ago with. um, Well, they had a cruiserweight title, yeah. No, no, no. It was way, way before that. It was. Um, when they had some type of partnership with World Wrestling Council and um, another uh, promotion down there in Puerto Rico, they had some type of um, cruiserweight show, mm-hmm. and they had the show was based around cruiserweights. And guess what? It went nowhere because there's so much you can do with cruiserweights. After a while, seeing the 50 million 450 splashes and shooting star press and, you know, all these flippy floppy moves and stuff, after a while, that gets boring. And, you know, down in AAA and CMLL and, you know, that's the norm down there. That's the high spot for them. 
Well, and I think I think that what the plan is is to is to push a cruiserweight product that that taps into that market. And I don't mean the market in terms of getting the wrestlers to come here, because clearly Vince is already trying that. You know, he's got Alberto Del Rio, he's got Sin Cara, um, but and, and he's got Hunico. But I, I think I think more what we're going for with cruiserweights. And by the way, I, I, I only take issue with one part of what you said, and that is that WCW actually had a very successful cruiserweight program. And it launched the careers of such people as Dean Malenko, uh, yeah. Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, even Chris Jericho. You know, I mean, all these guys were cruiserweight champions at one point in their career. And so, you know, when, when, when I look at the cruiserweight division, do I think there's going to be a viable cruiserweight division in WWE again? And I think that's essentially what this guy's asking. No, I don't. Yeah, uh, I mean, I retired the cruiserweight belt four or five years ago. I was actually kind of upset because I thought one guy really got screwed, and it was Jimmy Wang Yang. Um, yeah, because he, he they'd been teasing him winning the title, teasing him winning the title, teasing him winning the title, and then they never let him do it. You know, it was always like, I mean, who are our cruiserweight champions? It was always like Tajiri, and it was always like you know Hooventude, and it was all these dudes, but. The guys that could legitimately go out there and entertain a crowd and bust their asses never really got a push in WWE. And that was just Vince going, you know something? It's here. It's part of the WCW legacy that I'm really kind of trying to phase out at this point. I really don't care about this. Kind of like what he does with the Divas division now, which is actually more his legacy than it was WCW's. I don't remember WCW really having a women's champion. Um, Actually, they did. Maybe they did, but it's it was so unmemorable to me that I just, you know, I don't even think back. That's not even what I remember when I think of WCW. Actually, <laughs> one the one unique the one unique niche that I do remember when I think of WCW is the cruiserweights, and it's because of the aforementioned Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko. Oh my God, we mentioned that name on our show, and Dean Malenko and and you know and Eddie Guerrero and all these guys. I, when when I think about cruiserweights, I think that if done properly and if done, you know, with no more respect than it deserves, then yeah, I think it would be okay. Uh, Personally, do I think it's going to last on the WWE Network? I don't think it matters. And the reason I don't think it matters is because I don't think the WWE Network is going to make it. Well, see, the thing is, like, you know, Yes, the cruiserweight decision in WCW was successful, but after a while, you know, it's one of those things that you get tired of seeing the same thing. And maybe this is the WWE's way of giving guys like Tyson Kidd, Yoshitatsu, you know, the smaller guys something to do, but at the same time, my... It, you know, why go and do this show if you're not going to take that division seriously? Well, that, that's why they're putting it on the WWE Network, though, because they're not taking it very seriously. And, you know, if if let's just suppose that we live in a world where the WWE Network survives and thrives. OK, and let's further assume that this this and I'm just being hypothetical here. Let's assume that this cruiserweight show takes off and a lot of people take an interest in it. I think at best what you're going to see is maybe one or two guys sneak through there and get in, get onto the main brands. You know, basically what this is now is it's NXT for little people. That's what yeah. this cruiserweight show is going to be. It's going to be NXT for little people. Okay, so but it's not even it's not even a fresh idea when you think of it like that. We already have WWE superstars on WWE.com. We've already got WWE NXT on WWE.com. And that's essentially the same show, just with different faces, okay? And then you've got this, I don't even know if they're going to do another Tough Enough. Probably not after their winner got canned, you know, without ever even wrestling. I hope not. I just, Vince McMahon is always looking to to reach that next frontier. And all I've got to say is two things. Number one, XFL, anybody? Oh, God, why did you bring that up? I tried to erase that from my brain. Because it is an awesome parallel between what he tried to do then and what he's trying to do now with this network. And and the second thing is, and and we can go ahead and close here, is Vince, if Oprah Winfrey couldn't make a network happen, what makes you think you're going to do any better? 
I mean, Oprah Winfrey's got a network, but it is fucking tanking. It is going down faster than than a hooker in a Vegas alley, okay? It's not pulling ratings. Fucking, I mean, it just, it's not. If Oprah Winfrey is struggling to get a network going, what makes Vince McMahon think he can do that with a niche market? You know, at least Oprah Winfrey had broad appeal across a wide demographic. Vince McMahon has a niche market. Well, I mean, like... brother, less is more. Yeah, well, the thing is, like, with the WWE Network is, you know, if you look at 10 years ago, you know, everybody was watching wrestling. Now, a lot of people don't even realize it's still on TV. And for them to have their own network, it's like, okay, if that's what you want to do, and then they were talking about bringing back old shows like the old Nitros and old Raws and, you know... Giving you different type of shows and stuff like that, which is fine, but you know what? Like, who's going to really sit there and watch all that all day? Right. You know, not many people really. Wrestling to you know normal people is a joke. Well, you know, you know, like I told you that one day on Facebook. You know, I'm going on twenty three and. For people to be like, you still watch that? Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm never going to grow up. So the point of even having a network is kind of like, what are you doing? And I just don't see this whole, I don't see this network happening. Well, I'm, I am um, older than 23, and I get <laughs> snorts and scoffs of derision as well, especially at my age. But the thing is, is even as a wrestling fan all my life, and and I finally made it to a WrestleMania last year, and, and, and that, that was just like, it was a cool thing to do. I can mark that off my list. I may go to the WrestleMania next year because it's happening an hour from my house, okay? But as far as all that goes, part of the cool thing about being a wrestling fan is the anticipation that builds up between my viewings of the product. Yep. You know, I love the fact that I'm not watching wrestling six days a week and I'm not overloading on it and it's not my whole life, you know. I mean, I I don't need that constant sensory input from something I enjoy because you tend to enjoy it less after a while. You tend to expect more from it. And when things don't develop at a rapid pace, A, it's because you're watching the shit every day and they've got to milk it out, you know. But then B, it's hard to build anticipation. One of the reasons that I'm getting sick of all these fucking pay-per-views is because they come in bunches. Yeah. And it's it's like if we spaced this shit out more and we did more story and character development and we made these feuds last longer and and we made them slower builds and slower boils, the payoff would be so awesome at the end of it. You know, one of the things I actually did admire about the John Cena Rock feud last year was that Rock would, would would pop in, we'd get some shit going, and then he'd back away, and, and, and the tension would ease for a while, and Cena would go get involved in other things. But you knew that sooner or later, it was going to come back to that. You know, The anticipation would build and build and build. Ooh, Rock's coming in in three weeks. I wonder what's going to happen, because you know he and Cena are going to confront each other. One of, the, one of the awesome things about wrestling always has been the anticipation. I go back to being a kid watching Mid-South Wrestling. In the, in the early to mid-80s, okay? And it was on for one hour every Saturday. That's it. That's all I got for a whole week was one hour of wrestling every Saturday. And all week long, I would sit at school and go, oh, shit, I can't wait for Saturday. I can't wait for Saturday. I would yeah. stay awake late on Friday night laying in my bed just waiting for wrestling to come on the next day. I'm a 10-year-old kid, mind you. And when I got up the next day and I watched wrestling for that one hour, it was just like, God, this is so awesome. But yeah. now it's, we've got the internet, and people can go on these dirt sheets, and people can go on, you know, and you follow your wrestlers, favorite wrestlers on Twitter. Every day there's some, they're using Twitter now for storyline development. And it's like every fucking day something's going on. And I think maybe, honestly, CR, that may be one of the reasons why when we go to watch Raw on Monday night, we're A, burned out on all the sensory input that we've had all fucking week building up to the show. And then B, when we get there, we expect more than we're going to get because we've been feeding on the shit all week long. Sometimes yeah. it's better to just let it breathe. 
Well, see, the thing is, you know, like I told you, you know, I I never really told many people how much of a nerd I was. You know, the only person knows is King J in chat room because he's known me since middle school. I was, oh God, you think I'm bad now? When I was in middle school, I kept a goddamn journal. I wrote everything down that was going on. I watched wrestling religiously. I knew everything. You couldn't tell me nothing. Every magazine, every PWI, and every The Wrestler, every WWE magazine, every Raw magazine, every every SmackDown magazine, every WCW magazine, every WOW magazine, every wrestling magazine there was I had. All of them. And, you know, I was telling Jeff a couple weeks ago, I went in the store doing grocery shopping and I'm going past the magazine aisle and you know I'm looking around looking at books and stuff and I'm you know I'm looking at books because I'm like huh maybe you know get a book read every once in a while and I just glance over and I'm noticed that there's only like two wrestling magazines left now all the other wrestling magazines that used to be around. I mean, when I was younger and I go to magazine now, I didn't know which one I wanted to pick. Yeah. Now it's just WWE Magazine or PWI. That's exactly right. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow. That's because the rest of the shit's on the internet. And, you know, and, and it's also the thing of people just don't care about it anymore. And, you know, years ago... When I was like, in, you know, before I got to middle school, Monday Night Raw and Nitro, if you did not watch Raw or Nitro, when you come to school Tuesday, no one would talk to you. You had to watch both. You would flick back and forth between the channels, see what's going on Nitro, what's going on Raw, and then you have to wait a whole week, well... WCW had Thunder, and I really didn't watch that. But you had to wait the whole week to find out what happened on Raw or Nitro. And yep. that anticipation of being like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Oh, my God, I wonder what's going to happen. You were so excited where now I'm like, I don't want to know what happened. I don't care. Like It's just totally right. different. And within 10 years... I've grown to going more so against of hating watching wrestling. And yes, I do understand the irony of us sitting here on a weekly wrestling podcast, this one having gone just about two hours now tonight, and complaining about how there's too much on the internet about wrestling and it's kind of killed our joy. Yes, I do. I do appreciate the irony of us doing that. (laughs) We all have the problem. We know that. Yeah, but... Uh, a lot of people don't understand. This is what happens, <laughs> right? You know, and if you can't beat them, join them. It's the way I figured at this point. But I, listen, I, I just you know to answer the question: Do I think the cruiserweights are going to break through on the on the red or blue brand? No. Like I said, one may squeak through because you know we we've certainly we've certainly seen a change in Vince's philosophy recently, and that is he's not afraid to push smaller guys now. And really, all along, he kind of wasn't. I mean, yeah, you you can make a case that he's always sort of preferred the bigger dudes, but Shawn Michaels was WWF champion in the mid-'90s, and he's always been a smaller guy, you know? I mean, and then you look at it, and he might have been the exception to the rule back then, I guess, but, I mean, look at these days. Who, who's who's feuding for the WWE title? CM Punk and, and Daniel Bryan. And if those guys are over 200 pounds, it ain't by much. Both of them. Rey Mysterio is a multiple-time world heavyweight champion. You know? So it's not like Vince is just absolutely adverse to putting a title on a smaller guy. Um, yeah. So maybe somebody with, with that it factor squeaks through there. Maybe. But personally, do I think cruiserweights are going to make it? I'm not sure that whole network is going to make it. I just I can't That's- see... I can't see a, a broad, wide-ranging demand for what it is that that network is going to be, according to what we've heard. And again, that's, I go back to XFL. That's my thing of, you know, nothing against the cruiserweights, but it's just that the way things are going and how WWE is, you know, 
cooking and how things are just going in general, don't they? I don't see this network happening. I think and if it does happen, it won't last. If it does happen, I see it actually being good for a while and then quickly turning sour, like Oprah's right. network. Right, and then my question is, is if, if, you, if you're serious about putting all these shows on, why not just up your bandwidth and put them on WWE.com and get more hits off that? Why Let's... waste the money putting a network on the air that you're just going to end up having to take down in a year? Why not use the medium that you already have that is already successful I mean, hell, Zack Ryder made a career out of YouTube. Now you've got Santino Morella on YouTube. Why not use that medium for this this type of shit instead of insisting on carving out a network that, you know, and really, okay, so you have a WWE network, and Vince owns damn near every tape library that matters. Well, you see, know? that's the thing. They want you. They want you to pay for it. He owns the WCCW tape library. He owns the WCW tape library. AWA. He owns the tape, tape library. He owns the, the ECW tape library. By he the owns way, half the shit in Japan's tape library. He owns like, his own tape library from WWE slash F. So he's making money hand over fist with these DVDs that he's selling. He's making money hand over fist at these live events and at the pay-per-views and, and T-shirt sales and action figure sales and all this shit. I don't even understand why he feels like he needs a network. That's almost like a rich guy looking at a Rolls Royce and going, you know what? I could use a third one of those. I mean, really, dude. Stick with what you know and make money. He's, 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 I, I think I know what it is, though. He was a pioneer and a trailblazer. WrestleMania changed the face of the business. It just did. Yeah. You know? Then he wound up beating down WCW after a long, drawn-out battle that he damn near lost on several occasions. Okay? He had the Attitude Era. I mean, he, he is a pioneer in this business. And I think he's, ha he's having a hard time letting go of the idea that he's just not a pioneer anymore. This, this, this network, you know, he tried the Football League 10 years ago. It fell apart. Oh, now he's God. Now network that's already doomed to failure. Dude... Just rest on what you already have that people are already paying money hand over fist to see and let that be the thing. Yeah. I'm not sure there's any more unexplored territory that he needs to go tackle at this point. That's all. So that's that's the answer to the question. And by the way, we have been asked to plug one last thing before we go. And I'm assuming this was cleared with Stevie J. I hope it was, but I'm going to go ahead and throw this in. Uh, Peter H. says that if you go to www.facebook.com slash Call of Duty Endowment and you share the photo on the wall, $1 goes to Hire Heroes USA. And I'm assuming that this is hiring uh, veterans of armed forces. It says the campaign runs until June 1st, and they have already raised $11,000. So, you know, if you feel like going to Facebook and checking that out, um, it sounds like it goes for a good cause. So, CR, any last thoughts before we roll out of here? Um... First off, Stevie J wants me to plug youtube.com slash angrymarts dot, that's D-O-T, like spell it out, com. And he also wanted me to bring up about uh, the new women's promotion in Florida called Shine Wrestling. Shine Wrestling is Shimmer's sister prom uh, promotion. It's um, owned by Dave Prezak, the founder, Sh Shimmer, and Full Impact Pro um, promoter. Sal Child, I can't pronounce his name, but they built it, this new women's promotion down in Florida, and their first um, iPay-per-view is on July 30th, and <sighs> no roster or anything's been announced yet. I just know that Daphne's involved, and Lexi Fife, and a couple other key players are involved with this promotion, and... Speaking of promotions, um, Women Superstars Uncensored, WSU, <sighs> I, I don't know, but right now things are looking kind of scary because two buyers that were looking to buy the company from um, Sean McCaffrey have backed out, and they only have one buyer left and the buyer has decided that the only way they're going to buy the promotion is if 
their uh, iPay-Per-View on June 16th does well. If it okay. doesn't do well, then that's just, it's probably going to be the end of WSU. I don't want to say it, but with Sean McCaffrey pulling out of it because of health reasons, where else is it going to go, folks? So the one buyer that's left wants to kick the tires and test drive the thing, and if it doesn't meet his expectations, he's out too. Yeah, and one of the buyers, one of the original buyers, was actually another independent promotion. Can't really blame the guy, though, right? No, I can't blame him, but it's kind of like money on this thing. Why do it? True, but at the same time, it's like yes, I know. I realize women's wrestling is not the big hoo ha anymore. Not many people care about it. A lot of people don't even realize it exists. A lot of people don't even realize there is women's wrestling promotions. I understand that. But if WSU goes under, then all there's really going to be left in the United States as far as a women's-based promotion is Shimmer and now Shine. And besides those, the aforementioned Layla, Beth Phoenix, and Kelly Kelly. And that's it. Everybody else, yes, you got women's wrestling and TNA, but if you have not watched the TNA knockouts matches lately, you understand my pain. Uh, WWE doesn't give a damn. <laughs> you know, and, and shamelessly so. Yeah, and all the other independent promotions, you know, without saying any names, they don't care about women's wrestling. That's why half the girls that used to be on their roster since day one are no longer there. And then in Japan, the women's promotions are being closed left and right. So it's like, if you want to be a woman wrestler, where the hell are you going to go? Nowhere. <laughs> so pretty much. I don't know. All right. Well, we appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I guess I don't really have any final thoughts. We, we've done a good job of covering just about everything I wanted to cover tonight. Um, incidentally, actually, I do have one parting thought, and that is that uh, The Rock has set his return for January. So he'll be busy filming movies between now and then. They pushed back the release of G.I. Joe, the sequel, because they wanted to make it a 3D movie. So... Um, between now and January, if you want to see The Rock, go to the movies. That's it. So basically, since I haven't told you this, but um, in July, you know, they're starting a three-hour Raw. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm thinking of retiring from Raw <laughs> when that starts. So basically, you're telling me the only time I need to watch Raw is when The Rock returns in January. <laughs> yeah, basically. And, and by the way, it's a good thing this show is not a results-based show and that we're more oh, of a topic Jesus. Show because... I, I if if listen, you know, I admire Alex Goff and Killikev for even wanting to tackle doing a result show on a three hour raw every fucking week. Because I would probably just slip my wrist with a butter knife and call it a call it a life. But anyway, um well folks, I think that's gonna just about do it for this week's edition of the Tuesday Amp on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. We wanna thank you for listening. We encourage you to send your feedback to us and your questions. To and Angry Mark, and yeah, we do read your email. We read the one we got this, or the two we got this week, uh, to angrymark at gmail.com. You send it, it'll get read on the air. Now, if it's a dumb question, we might make fun of you, but either way, your email will get read on the air. In the meantime, I'm... I am Frank. That is Ciara. Ciara, thank you so much for all your contributions. 